I want to just share with you, I've, uh, 42, if I live to see December 31st, it'll be 42 years that I got hit. And I've spent much of the time trying to put things together. What happened, you know, you say, well, come on, Ron, you were there. Well, I know, but, but uh, there are things that happened that I've always had questions about. And I never really understood a lot of it until I said in a seminary class about 15 years ago or 20, something like that, uh, in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. And the, the uh, professor was teaching through the book of Exodus. And I, and I began to understand me. When he, when he started in the book of Exodus, and I was, I was just caught up in it. I mean, I've read it just like you did. Moses and, and, uh, and the uh, Pharaoh had demanded that the children be, uh, destro- the, uh, the males had to be destroyed. And, and God in his ultimate wisdom and love and grace had taken the, the mother, Pharaoh, and guided her. And you can read the scripture of chapter 2 uh, as good as I can. And uh, she put him in a little basket, put him in the reeds, hid him. And lo and behold, the only person that would absolutely save his life was Pharaoh's daughter. And, and, and it's just a, it's a picture of protection. And it is piece by piece by piece by piece that just worked for the life of Moses and saved his life because God had a plan for him. And, it was, and it's unique. And I, and I begin to understand me. Now, I flunked the test because uh, I, I was caught up trying to figure me out. So I'll tell you that right up front. You'll ask me that afterwards. And, uh, but, but that's what happened. And I, and I began to understand. I spent all of these years trying to put pieces together. I served with a long-range recon uh, team. We went out in five, six-man teams and uh, did recon. I like to call us grandchildren of Merrill's Marauders, World War II Rangers. And when, when uh, January 1st came around, 1969, they were instituted, reinstituted the Army Rangers. I never went to Ranger school. I did all of my OJT on the job training. It was New Year's Eve, 1968. And uh, it was a bad day for me. I don't know how to explain to you other than say that it was a black cloud day. You've had those days where it just seems like a big black cloud is ha- hanging over you. I had one of those when Gaith and I come back from Colorado last week. Just a big black cloud. I mean, you know, whatever you touched went bad. And, and that's just, that's the way I felt. And it was a funny day. It was an odd day. I had just uh, 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 survived a... Uh, uh, Thanksgiving weekend uh, experience where uh, uh, my, and uh, six other guys that came out of the spot, uh, that, that went in the spot I came out of were killed. We lost, uh, lost contact with them four to seven minutes after they hit the ground, and I got out with my life. Uh, my team did. And uh, they went in, and they were mutely, uh, immediately mutilated and killed. And I just survived that. I just survived a, a, a Christmas uh, weekend where, uh, where we were in five guys uh, totally surrounded by at least a company uh, because we left a whole lot of dead on the ground and, and it was uh, a picture of a uh, uh, fat lady standing at the microphone, so to speak. And uh, we had uh, artillery coming in. If you're familiar with artillery with rounds about this size, within 50 yards of us. And you'd just bounce, it'd just rattle your teeth. and. And, uh, and so I finally figured out a way to, to get us out of here. And I thought if I could have the artillery do, a, do a, uh, a walk down from both sides of us, have gunships come in on the side of that, and then a pickup chopper in the middle of it, we could get out. And one guy decided he'd try it. Several refused to come and get us. And, uh, and one guy said, I'll, I'll come get you. So I, so I set all this up. And here come the artillery, and you're bouncing and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they picked us up. When we got in the air, I was on the phone with the FAC, which is a forward air uh, observation plane, a little fixed wing that flies way overhead and does a lot of recon itself. Five guys. And because the artillery and the gunships and all that, he said to me over the phone, 
He said, you have left a hundred dead on the ground. So I knew that we were in trouble. So I'd survived all of these, and you get a little nervous, you get a little antsy. You know, I'm down to about 90 days, and, you know, ready to come home. So New Year's Eve comes around, and we have this mission to go on. I'd given up my R&R so another guy could have it, so I didn't get to go on R&R, and, &R and and, uh, and my lieutenant told me, he said, if you go ahead and do this up into January, he said, we'll, uh, uh, we'll uh, uh, promote you to E6, and, uh, and I'll, I'll put you in the office, and you'll be done. So I agreed to all of that, and, and, uh, and away we went. So we got up the morning, and, and I had done all the preliminary things. Well, I got up the next morning, and, and, and I was the, well, myself and two other guys were the longest surviving guys in the company. We had more time in grade. We had uh, we, we'd just been there longer. We just knew the ropes. We had just been there. We, we knew it. And so uh, I got up the next morning and I was like a green bean. I mean, I could not do anything right. Boy, that black cloud was just hanging there and I knew something was wrong. I just couldn't figure it out. And I, uh, and, and I, and I, I I could just go through nitpick stuff, you know. If you, I know the picture went pretty quick, but the picture where that that he showed that, where just before I got shot, there was a smoke grenade over the right side. If you happen to notice that, you'd had to pick it up pretty quick and know it. But, but he was over the right side. I stumbled getting in the truck, and I was so furious with myself. I grabbed it off the ground and I put it on this side, and just so happens it uh, saved my life. And so there's just crazy stuff like that that happened. And, and matter of fact, my first sergeant was so upset with me, he hollered all the way across the company area. And he was a big man. And, uh, and he was a mean man. And he called me all the way across the company area. And I heard him and he said, come here. And I went over there and I can't tell you the colorful language he asked me what's wrong with me. But he did. And he locked my heels and he said, you know, he went through this long entourage. What is wrong with you? He said, I've watched you fumble. I've watched you fiddle. I've watched you stumble. I've watched you do everything. And I said, I don't know. I said, something's wrong and I can't put my finger on it. So uh, he ordered me back. He said, go. And he said, stop this monkeying around and get this done. Get your team. Get out of here. And uh, we were going out, which made me uncomfortable, and I know that you're going to say, you go in five-man teams, and, and more than that makes you uncomfortable. Well, it did. When you get comfortable with something, you get comfortable. And so anyhow, uh, we were going out. Um, a, a buddy of mine down in Texas says there was 18, and, we were, and this is pieces I'm trying to put together. I thought there was 28. There was four six-man teams. That makes 24, and each team had one brand-new guy. I found the brand new guy, the guy I'd been looking for for 41 years last June. And I put him on a helicopter. He got shot about 15 minutes before I did. And so, so he says there's 18, and I thought there's 28. So we really don't, we really don't know, but the, the, the impact is still there. So we head out, and, and uh, first of all, I started belly aching because we were going the same way. I learned over time that you never did anything the same way. I was alive because I learned that the easy way. And they sent us out. Well, I had been out there so many times, I didn't even need a map. And, uh, and of course, that upset some. And, and so, so uh, we go out, and uh, here we start, start through the jungle, and I'm uh, rear security. And we go through there, and of course there's this massive explosion. And uh, immediately we pull up, and, and it is uh, the guy that I just told you about finding uh, after 41 years. He was from Oklahoma, and, uh, and I was trying to get a hold of him to get him in my squad, maybe try to keep him from ki getting killed. And so anyhow, I had uh, uh, I ran up there, and sure enough, he got blown uh, up by this, by this mine. Well, I patched him up, I, I uh, uh, got helicopters in, several of us working together. And uh, we got helicopters in, got him, got him out, and uh, got artillery in, and kind of everything else. So we stopped, we regrouped after we got these guys off. And uh, I remember patching him up, putting him on the helicopter, and, and patting him on the foot, and tell him, John, I'll catch you back in Oklahoma. Never, know, never knew how much he was injured. I knew that he was pretty bad. And so anyhow, we regrouped, and they said, well, continue your mission. Well, that makes you even more nervous because everybody in the world knows where you're at. 
So my sergeant who was in charge of the group says, Cruz says, take this, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Didn't even give me my squad. But said, take this guy, this guy, and this guy, and go. And so we were mapping out a, out a plan. He says, go. And he told me, and he showed me on the map, and you make a circle and come back into where this prearranged spot was, and then I'm going to walk them my route because I've already cleared the route. And so away we go. And I go down through there. I have a guy in front of me that, that uh, I was not used to as a point man. Uh, he was a uh, frequent user of marijuana and opium. That scared me. I knew it, but I was given orders. He was my point man. He was the John Wayne. He had to carry the, the uh, uh, shotgun with double odd buckshot, which is me was worthless. Might as well have been out there with a forked stick. You know, I, I mean, you know, how much, how many rounds can you carry? I carried about 21, 22, 23 clips with, with around 20 rounds, 18 to 20 rounds in each clip. And it was more uh, prevalent for me to have uh, uh, purification tablets and clips and ammo than food. And that's why I always packed. So anyway, we take off. I put this guy, as I said, on the helicopter and away he goes. And so we head off. Get about... Uh, uh, 200 yards away from the main element, and I stopped, and I made a, a combo check. I give him a, a coordinates, and he, he jots it down. He knows exactly where I am. And I, on the way, I have disarmed two uh, booby traps. They, uh, they use our Coke cans that you and I get, the, the 12 ounce Coke cans, they take the lid out of them because you and I throw them away back in Vietnam, beer cans, whatever. And they would pack them through tra with trash, C4s, a uh, heavy explosive. They'd pack them with trash, with pieces of metal, pieces of glass, whatever they could, could, could come up with. And then they would seal it some, with some sort of a wax or something, put a blasting cap in it, and it was ferocious. I have a spot in my leg that doesn't show up on x-ray, and it's a little black spot about the size of a BB in the... Uh, doctors think that it's probably a piece of glass. They, they don't know what it is that I, that I got. So I make this combo check. And I chew my point man out because he just goes stomping through the jungle. And I, and I tell him, we got all day. And I caution him because he's missed these two. And so I'm armed to the hilt. And he turns and he takes one step. And I take a half a step. And the grenade goes off right in my face. Took the whole side of his head off. Of course, immediately went to the ground. And remember me telling you a minute ago about the smoke grenade. that You can hold a smoke grenade. It'll hurt you heat hot, but it won't hurt you explosion-wise until it gets to the heat. So I had the smoke grenade here, and because of the frustration and this black cloud and everything I was doing wrong, I had taken it, normally I bend the clip up, the banana clip up uh, on the, the handle on it, because I can always just pull it and throw it, because that's what you want to do. You want to be in a hurry, you want to pull it and throw it. The ironic thing about it is, is that I carried all my ammo in the front because it's heavy. Right here, just at the belt buckle, I had two grenades, baseball grenades. Just beside them, I carried two white phosphorus grenades. And I carried everything else, all my ammo, all the way around the side. And, uh, and I had it. And that explosion went off, and that smoke grenade, now from my right side to my left side, exploded. Well, little did I know that smoke grenade was probably what saved our life because the machine guns had opened up from both directions, kind of in, in a crossfire. Well, you ever, you ever, you know, run a race or do something and you just kind of command your body mentally, do it again, you know, push harder, one more step? Well, I felt my body collapsing. And, of course, I didn't know what it was. And I knew I'd been hit, but I, but I couldn't. And I felt my body collapsing. And I'm screaming to my body from the inside. I'm saying, stand up, stand up, stand up. And, and my body kept collapsing. And I, I don't remember hitting the ground, but obviously I was on the ground. I was paralyzed all down the right side. And, uh, and so, uh, so I took, uh, 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 apparently my, my radio man was, uh, 
was right behind me, and I said, give me the radio. I called back to the, to the main element, and I, and I told them, I said, uh, we, uh, we got caught by, of course, I heard the gunfire and everything. I said, we got caught by an ambush. I said, I got one down. I forgot to tell them about me. <laughs> forgot to tell them I was hit. And I came back to the radio and said, how many is hit? And the radio man, of course, we're head to head, you know, in the jungle. And he leans up, and he said, there's two of you. And I, and, and I said, yeah, I said, there's two of us. And he said, who is it? And I told him, and I said, it's me. And uh, so, I, so I changed frequencies real quick, and I went to the artillery because I knew they were right on top of us, and, and I was trying to, to, to get them off of us because I didn't know how many there were, and I knew that one was dead, I was paralyzed, one guy froze on me, and so I literally had to use the television analogy, two and a half men to fight a war. And I wasn't much good. And so I immediately set up a perimeter, and I got artillery and gunships in the air, and of course artillery started. Got back on the horn, changed frequencies again, and uh, was trying to get a medevac in. Well, ironically, talk about the Moses small pieces. Ironically, the helicopter that just took my buddy out 15, 20 minutes earlier is in the air. They won't let him land because there's a hellborn assault leaving. That's a group of helicopters loaded with a, with a company or two companies of infantry. And so he's just hanging there. And he says, you're the same place you were a while ago? And I said, yes, sir. I said, we got some down. Need some more help. He said, I'm on my way. And he never had to start the helicopter up or I'd have bled to death. He never had to get clearance or I'd have bled to death. And he said, uh, uh, come into the same, call me. And he said, come into the same LZ. And I said, yeah, because I didn't know how far they'd carry me, and I didn't think I was going to make it anyhow. He said, uh, he said, okay. And so we had to cut trees and everything and get these guys out. So we already had a small LZ, and it wasn't big. You could just, it was about half the size of this room. And if you, you know, a heli setting a helicopter down takes some room. So anyhow, he uh, uh, he comes back in. Well, by that time, the guys got to me. We fended them off with the artillery. And, and, uh, and so I have all these questions. Was this command detonated or with a clacker, with a, with a wire? Or is this a trip wire? I, 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 I've, off, I've wondered that for 40 years until I, a guy told me what happened a couple, three years ago. I, uh, I was transported. The guys came in and, and uh, of course, began... They didn't tell me that the other guy was dead, but, but I knew he was hurt bad. And, uh, and so they loaded me up, and they took, uh, they, they took me, and I'm paralyzed down the right side. Now I'm right-handed, okay? So, so they took me down and put me on the helicopter, and I found one of the buddies that helped load me up is from Anderson, Indiana, and I found him about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And, and they took me on there, and they took my hand, and they laid my hand on my waist, and I'm shot all down the front here. And they took my hand, they laid it on the waist, they took my, I carried a car 15, back that time we call them car 15s, which is a little snub-nosed rifle, the butt, butt closed, collapsed, and the barrel was short, and it was a bush gun, and I, I was the first one to get it, and it was, uh, it was a darling little deal. So they took that gun, it wasn't really that heavy. And they put it up there, and they began to take my fingers, and they put it on the gun so I could hold the gun and point it that way, only that way. And they flipped it to, to fully automatic. And uh, they said, when we raise up, you start shooting, because they're carrying me through gunfire. And so they raised me up on the, on the deal, on the uh, stretcher, and uh, the helicopter is sitting down there, and here they go. And I'm firing away. And I empty that clip. So they get me to the helicopter. Well, the guys have heard back to base camp what has happened. Helicopters on the way to the Mash Hospital. And so, uh, so as, a, as a result, the guys run plumb across base camp to get over there. And so here's all my guys that originally I was with that are leaving country, that are, that are going out of country. And, uh, and they're standing there. And so they pick my stretcher up at a dead run about a Oh, 50 or 100 yards, they ran to the MASH hospital with me, and I'm going like this. And they're carrying me, and I'm bouncing like crazy. And, uh, and so, so they carry me in there. The doctor says, put him up here on the table. And, and they just, I, I never will forget, of course, I had a, had a shirt on, had my khakis. I still had my uh, ammo pack on. Uh, none of the grenades went off. None of, as obviously, none of the uh, ammo went off. 
and I normally carry a Claymore mine right here in the front. Claymore mine would probably set it right here and probably blow this whole wall out. And so I normally carry the Claymore mine just tied to the front because when we set up a night for protection, you needed that. And, uh, and uh, I just didn't happen, I happened not to get it that day. Some of the mess up I did, you know. And, but it just pieces that God put together. The helicopter happened to be in the air and, and all of these crazy things. And, and uh, so, they, so they carried me in the hospital. Well, the guys standing there, they're, oper they're, they're doing a minor surgery. It had cut the major artery in my right arm and blood just, you know, you know looked like a fountain of youth or something. It, and, I, and I was bleeding to death quickly and the guys in the field had tried to close the wound but it couldn't. I had a sucking chest wound and had cut the lung, collapsed the lung and I'm, I'm in pretty bad shape. <laughs> so these guys carry me, they carry me from the helicopter in, they lay me on the table, and these guys are standing there watching uh, four guys. I never will forget, they were on both sides. There were two on this side and, and then two on this. They were standing there watching the doctor cut my clothes off of me. And he went down and, and I didn't cry until they cut my boots off. You know, I, I, I had... I had Baby, those boots, they were like moccasins. I wore them all the time. And when he cut those off, boy, I, I mean, I just tears come in my eyes. I didn't care about cutting my clothes off. I just wanted my boots. I said, can I take my, I remember asking him, can I take my boots? He says, no. I said, we're going to burn them. So they put an IV in me. They put me, ran with the, the guys who were standing there. They ran back to the hospital. I mean, to the helicopter. Put me on the, uh, uh, put me on the deal to the St. Francis of South Vietnam. And uh, it took me into the hospital. And, and uh, if you've seen these graded, uh, I don't know how to tell them, how to tell you what it is, but, but it's not a concrete runway. It's just kind of graded material. Well, they put me on a stretcher when the helicopter come in. They put me on a stretcher and pushed me across there. And I'm going <laughs> all the way across this thing into the deal. I never really panicked. I was conscious. I was conscious. And uh, uh, of all of this happening, and I never really panicked until they put me on the x-ray table. When he pushed me over, scooted me over on the x-ray table to take the x-rays, and when he put me, and I looked at the uh, uh, stretcher, and you know how a stretcher has a dip in it? It was full of blood. It was completely full with blood. And when they pulled me off the uh, uh, x-ray table, and I looked back at the x-ray table, blood was pour, running off of it just like you'd pour water on it. Two interesting side notes that really come out of this that I have not a clue uh, to how to explain it to you. But first thing, well, the moment I got hit, and I'm on the radio, I'm busy, I'm trying to get us out of here, I'm trying to live, I'm trying to do all this kind of stuff in my head, and, and my eyes are open, and, I, and for, to some degree I'm thinking, and, uh, and, and rationalizing all of this, uh, I, I look, and I'm looking, and of course there's yellow smokes everywhere, but here is a full length picture or presentation, or whatever you want to ghost, whatever you want to call it, of my grandfather. Now, I had real life heroes, my dad, my uncle, my grandfather. I had those. They never failed me. But here was my grandfather, and he always wore the drab khaki clothes and a drab gray shirt. That's all he ever, I never seen him in anything else. And he was standing there, and he said, come on home, son, come on home. And he stood there, and, and, uh, and then just kind of vaporized, disappeared. My grandfather died in 65. This was New Year's Eve, 68. Second thing coming about is my brother Gary sitting here. I woke my dad up, our dad, in the middle of the night, about three, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, went in there in the bedroom and woke him up and, and uh, said, Dad said, I just heard a massive explosion. Well, we live on, at that time, live on a little hill. You can see pretty good distance, especially at night. And so he and Dad got up and went around and, and, and looked the house over and looked around the countryside and never saw explosion. Well, it bothered him, bothered him, bothered him. Well, we put the thing together and found out it was the exact time, pretty close, I guess, that I got hit, that this grenade went off. 12,000 miles away, Gary heard the explosion. I don't know how you explain that. I've often wondered. I've told people that. I said, explain to me. They said, there's no expl explanation to it. That's just it. So they carried me to the hospital, and I went through surgery. Doctor, next morning, doctor came in, and and uh, he, uh, uh, I, I had this deep fear of losing my right arm, and so uh, he did not have uh, bed manners, bedside manners, or anything, and and the sheet was across me like this, 
and I had bandage all over my head. I got hit seven times in the face. No smart remarks, Terry. <laughs> I've, not had, I've not had reconstructive surgery. I know I need it, but I haven't had it. It wouldn't help. It wouldn't help. I knew it. I knew it. And uh, so, uh, uh, so I had bandages all over my face and my eyes, and the sheet was across like this. Well, I figured I lost my right arm. Doctor came in, sat down beside me, and he said, uh, looked at me, and he said, you raised on a farm, soldier? And I said, yes, sir. I thought, what does that have to do with it? My ears were ringing. I was hurting, and you come out from under anesthetic, you know, and blah, you know. And he said, uh, raised on cow milk, wasn't you? <laughs> and I'm thinking, where is this going? I don't want to talk to you. I hurt. I don't care about cow milk. And he pulls the sheet back. I mean, just rips it back. I won't ever forget it. Well, first thing I did, look, see where my, if I had a right arm. And he said, it's pretty evident that you were raised on a farm and on cow milk. He said, because it never broke a bone in your body. I took 11 pieces of grenade in my chest and stomach. I have three point blank on a breastbone. And he asked me, he said, you know what happened when a breastbone closes, I mean collapses? I didn't even know what a breastbone was. I said, no. He said, you die. And I took three shots point blank. He said, the heck of the deal is it didn't even crack your bone. And then when I took the three pieces in the right arm, he says, you know, he said, if it broke out a bone, he said, we'd had to uh, amputate the arm. He said, you, there was nothing there. And he said, and besides that, he said, you took one dead on on the, on the, on the right thigh. You took three in the kneecap. You took one on the shin of both legs. And he said, a bone is not cracked any place. I just couldn't explain that. I just knew that something happened. I was really quiet because I was not a Christian at that time. I did not know, uh, you know, uh, what had caused all of this and, and so on. So I couldn't put it together. And so I come home and as I told you in the beginning, I spent 40 years trying to put all these pieces together. And I discovered that mom had been praying for me. My grandmother had been praying for me. And I found about three or four years ago that I had an uncle, my cousin Anita in Oklahoma City. Uh, my uncle had, uh, he and his family had prayed day and night for me. Not because of me, but because of their prayers. So as the doctor sat there and he began to talk to me, he said, you know, he said, uh, you had a piece hit awful close to your heart. He said, we had to with he said, that's what we were after is a piece in the heart sack. Well, I didn't know what a heart sack was. He said, you know, if you'd have been jarred just a little bit, he said, it'd have punctured your heart. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, okay. I replay in my mind being carried from the field at a dead run with a, with a gun on my chest rattling bullets away to provide cover so those guys, I'm thinking about my buddy standing there at the helipad in a panic that I'm going to die and they grab it and run the stretcher with me on it at a dead run. I'm thinking about the time that they put me on that little wheeled gurney, whatever you'll call that thing, and put me across this this uh, uh, helipad uh, into the emergency room, and I'm thinking, wow, I survived. Somehow, all those little pieces come together. The grenades never went off. The smoke grenades never went off. The helicopter just happened to be in the air. How on earth I could survive being shoved that carried that far and that piece not penetrate my heart. Now you might call it luck, but I call it the grace of God. Amen. I begin to try to put my life back together and put all this behind me. And of course, <laughs> I come home, Gary, my brother again, was trying to help me heal. And he says, come go to the hay field with me. 
And I said, I can't even drive a truck. I can't even pick up a bale. I can't even drive. I, I'm worthless to you. And he said, come on anyhow. And so we go south of Perkins over there and, and uh, get, uh, uh, get uh, in a hay field. And here comes a twister down the, down the Canadian River. And I'm thinking, I survived Vietnam. I'm going to die in a stupid twister. <laughs> yeah. He goes up and gets up on a hill. He runs around the truck, opens the truck. I can't, I'm, Im, I'm immobile. I'm almost immobile. I just barely can't walk. And he reaches up there like a kid, and he pulls me out of the truck, drags me underneath the truck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's raining, mud, and all that stuff. And he tucks me underneath the truck, and I think, oh, boy, just the grace of God. I come home, and I marry my high school sweetheart in June of 1969. And in July of 1970, I bury her. She dies from uh, colon cancer. And my life is really in a tizzy now, and I'm really spinning out of control. But I don't know how to get a hold of anything. I can't, I can't grasp anything. So I spin helplessly out of control. So I try to go to college, and that really was not a deal for me at that time in my mental state. So I'm sitting in a biology class. I think it's a biology class, wasn't it, dear? Yeah, she says, yeah. So along comes this girl named Gaitha. She's got to leave OBU to come to a real college to get a real guy. <laughs> <coughs> Last night, last class, last test, last time ever, I asked her for a date. And uh, here's a strong Baptist girl looking at a guy chewing on a cigar in a test. <laughs> and she goes out with me. And we marry, of course. And uh, 74, well, I surrendered to the ministry. And so we begin, or I'm, well, let me back up, just I missed one step there. Uh, just before we were married, uh, we had a preacher kind of pinch hitting. Mike's done this and I've done this, but you kind of do the preliminary stuff and another preacher, you know, does the wedding service. And, and uh, so I've done that, and, and, but this preacher was pinch hitting. And, and so uh, he was doing all the preliminaries and counseling us and so on and so forth. And so, so I began to go to church with Gaitha, and, and he was pastor of another church. And So one night after church, he says, y'all come down, I want to talk to you. And busy like Mike is, just run ragged. And, and so I went down, and he began to share the gospel with me. And, uh, and uh, that Sunday night, in Emmanuel Baptist Church in Henrietta, Oklahoma, I put it all together. And I trusted the Lord as my personal Savior. And then Gaitha and I were married, and then I surrendered the ministry, and I served the Lord. Baptist churches back then had a philosophy that if God would keep the preacher humble, they'd keep him poor. <laughs> and uh, y'all know what that means. And uh, so Gaitha and I lived destitute, serving the Lord. And that was our life. We loved it. We pastored four churches here in Oklahoma. And in 91, 92, come along, and I began to get sick. I began to go to doctors, and I began to go to specialists. And they said, well, you got this. And they'd run the test. Well, you got tuberculosis. And they'd run the test. They'd say, well, you got this, and you got that. And I've heard you got this, and you got that so many times, I've got it memorized. Finally, one of the doctors, lady doctors, she says, you have a lupus. She said, we just don't know what strand it is. And so I went back to my main doctor, and he says, the stress of the, of the, of the damage and the shrapnel wounds and, and all of this kind of stuff, he said, is taking its toll. And he said, you need to get out. He said, you're, you're complicating it with the stress of the ministry and the stress of, of what has happened. And he said, your body is collapsing. Because it came to a place that, that, that I was just on the edge of collapse. I, I, I came to the place one day when I really recognized it uh, that I could not pick up an aluminum chair and put it in the back of the pickup. Uh, that's, that's how far I had declined. So I retired, mad at God. Isn't that true? We get mad at God when God don't do what he wants us to do. 
and 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 we get we get in, in that in that predicament. And I had I threw my little ringtail fit with God. You know, I, I spent all my life. I have nothing. I, I have literally nothing. And you throw me out. You throw me out under the bus. And God seemed to say to me that if you'll just settle down, I'll take care of it. And lo and behold, before it ever got started, I began to preach in churches all across central Oklahoma, here where we've lived. We came to Old Mulgee, and I retired for seven years in Old Mulgee. And I just preached from church to church to church to church to church, doing interim. And God opened up brand new doors and began to give me places to serve. And it come to a place of just realizing that if I just settle back and let God take care of the deal, I was okay. So, now then today, here it is 2010, it becomes a political football game like anything else. And, and, and some crazy things have happened in, in the last few weeks. And I don't know what, where God has taken me now, but, but I'm ready to go. I don't know what's taken place, but I know that God has held me in the palm of his hand, Amen. and I'm alive today because of it. Now, you call it luck if you want, but I don't think so. I've, I, I've read Moses. I've seen too many things, and the small things that God took care of, all it had to do was for that piece of grenade off that is to just chip the top of one of those grenades and I'd have been really gone. All I had to do was just put that claymore like I did every time and wear it in the front and I'd still be in orbit today. But it didn't work that way. And God took all those small pieces and he put them together to give me a second shot. I found, as I told you earlier, John friend of mine that I put on the helicopter, found him last year, found another piece to my life. And I keep trying to put it together. And the more I put it together, the more I understand that it is the infinite wisdom in the movement of a holy God. Amen. Why would I tell you all of this? There were 13 citations, or excuse me, excuse me, I'm incorrect. There were 10 citations for valor in that shootout. It was a wild day. I understand the black cloud now. And why would I tell you all of this? Because I'm something? No, I'm not anything. I'm just, as my buddy says, a survivor. I just happen to survive. I've had a lot of questions about me and my life about why this all happened. But I tell that to you so we can see together the love and the grace of a holy God. I took my kids and my grandkids to Washington, D.C., as many of you know, this past March to let them see Washington, D.C. And I took them to see the wall. And I showed them the guys I knew that paid the ultimate sacrifice. And sometimes we forget that. And it is God's grace that gets us through. I want to close with this little story I read the other day. Preacher had just... Uh, preached his, his sermons at the, at the revival. He got on the plane for the long trip back home. As he got on, he noticed a small child sitting across the aisle in the deal. She had her dolls and her toys like six, seven, eight-year-old child would have. And she was sitting there and she was playing plane took off. Pretty soon somebody came on and says, please take your seats, fasten your seat belts, we're going to go through some turbulence. 
preacher described that as turbulence as he's never been through before in his life, and the, as if somebody was just shaking the plane. People were screaming and hollering and throwing up, and, and he was trying to hold his stomach. And all the while, the little girl just sat over and played with her doll and changed the clothes and do all the things that a little girl will do. And everybody's holding their stomach, and they grab the bags to, to, to uh, call Roy about a Buick in, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about there. And, and, uh, and so uh, uh, finally the plane lands, and everybody's trying to get their stomach back together and trying to you get off. And this little girl's just playing. You know, she's buckled in. She's just still playing. And the preacher leans over to her and says, Isn't that, didn't that scare you? And she raised up and her eyes just sparkled and she had this Shirley Temple smile. And she said, oh no. She said, my daddy's the pilot and he's taking me home. <laughs> I want to tell you something. My heavenly father's the pilot. And he's got a home for me. Come and join me.